Hi, this is Behind the Code from Artblocks. I am Dan Cat, and I'm here to talk about 80s pop. So to talk about 80s pop, I think we need to put it a little bit into the context of 70s pop and how that all developed. So right back at the start with 70s pop series one, I didn't really know what I was doing with gas prices and all of that type of stuff, how much it cost. And I must admit, when I looked at the other art that was already on art blocks, I thought, well, it's a little bit basic, but that's because I didn't realize at the time you have to keep the code really small. So I wanted to do this stuff with color in 70s pop, and I was worried that it would start bloating the code too much. So I kind of ditched it, which is why series one is primarily gradients and solid colors. But it works by taking graphic tiles and then putting them together. So there's two basic tiles. There's one that has curves on it, and then there's another one that has straight lines. And then you put those together and you start rotating them and you get these more complicated patterns. But they're just these graphic squares. And then with series two, I wanted to run this colors down, like having a rainbow. So you'd have a set here and then another set here and they go together and they match. But as soon as you rotate them, they no longer match. So you needed all this logic to be able to get all the colors to go through. And again, I was worried that would take up too much space. So I did this trick where you start mirroring them. You have the same color on the outside going into the middle. So they work either way. And that, that fixed that one. But I still wanted this, this flowing color type of effect. Thought I'd read out a little bit from a message that I got because it, it made me chuckle a little bit, but it goes like this. Now you release 80s pop, which if we're honest, is an extension of the pop series and for many of the outputs, a tweak of the 70s. Now what makes me laugh about that is the code is completely revamped and completely rewritten and I wish it was a tweak, but it's really not. Starting with Battle Zone. Because I have all these lines that are now stored as points, so they're vectors and, and lines joining between them, instead of these solid tile graphics, I can start to transform them and move them around, which allowed me to do the battle zone thing. I really wanted to do it, but originally laying the tiles out so they're going to go into the distance was kind of tricky. But this solves that problem. So if you have all the points and you have a square like this, and I know that I have a point here and they're gonna form a a curve and this point is 30% of the way across the square and then it's also let's say 60% of the way down. Now if I have another sort of thing projected onto the edge of a cube or top of a cube I can then go across 30% of this top line and 30% of this bottom line and draw a line down and then go 60% of the way down this line. 60% will give me a point here. So I can slowly translate this point in a normal square to wherever I want things projected onto the most extreme of tiles. 30%, 30%, go down 60% to here. And that gave me the mapping to put things onto the floor and also onto the pillars. If we have a quick look at the code for that, let me just start this. So I basically got remap points where I send it a whole bunch of lines and then the four corners, set up a new lines array that they're going to get put into, go through all the lines, loop through all the points, and then this bit here is the bit that translates, transforms it from one plane to another, the top X and the top Y, the bottom, get between them, and now uh, we tuck those points back into the points array, push those into the lines, and then return the whole new set of lines, and, and we're all set. Of course, not only does that give me the flat tiles, but also these cubes and then the areas between them that you sort of give you the points and you crash into things. Now, so at this point, we probably need a little bit of old arcade game games theory. In the olden days, you didn't really ever win a game. You just sort of got a high score and you tried to beat other people's high score. You would always die. Ultimately, the game had to kill you. So things I had to consider in here is how to eventually kill the player before they run out of the landscape and, and cause a bug or until they run out of the pillars. Because things had to be deterministic, the game has to be exactly the same each time you restart it. I can't just place the pillars randomly during the game. They all have to be decided in this case right at the beginning. In the code here, from tile 12 up to 10,000, we're gonna have pillars and we're gonna have them every fourth 
well, when we display them, they're going to be every fourth row to give you a little bit of time to move from one to the other. The other thing that I decided to do is start off having easy, so you have a pillar, and then you have one, two, three gaps between them that the ship can fly between, and then that will drop down to two gaps, and then ultimately there'll just be one gap which you can go through to score with. And that's decided here, so you've got your uh, three gap, two gap, one gap as they get closer together. Now the reason for that is we're going to kill the player by going faster and faster. So on each row that pillars appear, there's two points where there's pillars that can kill you, and only one point that gives you the score. Ultimately, you'll be going too fast to be able to realistically fly between the pillars, and statistically, you'll hit the pillar more often than you'll hit the score, and also as the game progresses, when you go over a scoring tile, you get more score, and when you go through a pillar, you take more damage. Ultimately, the game is designed to be impossible, you can only try to go as far as you can. And that's because at some point I'm going to run out of pillars and when the code tries to call the pillars it'll fail and it'll probably throw an error and we don't want that. The other part that has to be deterministic is the landscape. So if we go back and have a look at this landscape we'll load a couple more up. So all of these tiles here, each time you load the same game game, the tiles will be in exactly the same place. But I don't want to pre-calculate those. I do actually want to count the run time. Tile range, we have this calculate visible tiles. So as the player moves forwards, I don't need to do all these calculations for everything. I only need to know what the viewer can see on the screen here. So a few here, wider tiles there, wider tiles. So we end up with a limited number of tiles that the user can see, as you can see here. They already go off there. So I calculate the visible tiles, and then that gives me a range. So if the players move to the left or the players move to the right, the range will be here, and as you move across, the range will go across to the right into the positives. So we pass those in, and then we loop through those tiles, and we calculate the tile type and the tile height. So if we go find that code, I'm basically taking the X and Y coordinates and I'm plugging them into this function, which is a whole bunch of uh, signs, sign, sign, and then we're returning it based on that. And the height, we might as well get them here, is calculating the four corners. So the one, two, three, four corners have to have different heights. And these two, the right-hand side of this tile, has to match the left-hand side of this tile so that they all go together. So I'm calculating the four tiles based on, again, the x, y coordinates, gives us this consistency over on the right-hand side here. And if we go through and find, oh, I just had one there, uh, here's an undulating one, so you can see this line down the middle here, that's basically just to the right of the zero. I think it's just the left of the zero, actually, I think I'm counting zero as positive. And you can see I've actually suppressed in the middle here, so they're slightly more squashed, and they get higher up as you go towards the edge. Normally, these middle ones here are all squashed down to be zero until you get to the edge. Anyway, I digress. So this math sign, math sign, math sign, if I was using this in maybe another project to show a whole bunch of pixels or something like that, the sign pattern, and then even if I'm using overlapping ones at different wavelengths, which I am doing here, would probably be a bit more obvious. But because you're flying like this, you probably don't recognize that there's a little bit of logic behind the tiles. They look random, but they're not there. They're completely predictable. The last thing I think probably on battle zone here is the font used here so press space to start and the high speed high score up there i had to encode a whole font into the system i ended up doing two of them again if we go have a look at the code let me go find it here is the font so i've got zero to nine these special characters and the whole alphabet here these if i just wipe this down we basically have a vector font with these bits here So we have the letter S or something like that. So all of them are coded by these set of vectors, which are stored in these here. So L is fairly simple. That tells which points to go to. And then when you have the right word function here, we're just going through and working out how wide the word is. So we're getting the total word width over here. And then we work out the left start is the total word width divided by two. So it's going to go onto the screen straight into the middle. And then we go through the array and we basically move to line two and then we draw it three times to kind of give this glow around it. Press space to start and high score. 
And then if I strategically die here, so we'll just fast forward this bit. I'm going to die in a second. My energy's going down here. Let's crash a bit more. And then we'll get our high score, which isn't greater than 696. Here we go. So I can control the size and the location of where I want the font to be and this kind of glow around it. Different games have different colors. So in the green one, uh, when it says press space, then it'll have a green font there. Talking of fonts, probably a good thing to do now is look at the Qbert. Let me go change this, right? So this bit here is telling me my normal chance is 75% of having the standard sort of tile layout. Uh, the film TV music tech chance is 10%, the Qbert is 6%, Memphis is 4%, and then the battle zone is normally 5%. For this demonstration, I'm changing these numbers here to be able to force what's coming up. So if I go back over here, we should now have Qbert. So I wanted a few things to happen, and this is the same in the battle zone. The, I wanted it to work as a static image, and I wanted to, it to work as a game because sometimes people can't interact with it on the phone, you obviously can't play this game. So when you first load it, we have the design as these cubes. Again, we're using the transformation and these tile as well. So the color on the left matches the color on the right. The other thing is after a while, so when you first have it, here is your sort of static. You do have color changing images and that's fine. But after a while, this thing called the attract mode kicks in, which is again something that's on fruit machines and in arcades, that's then suggesting there's a structure that's going to be involved in the game. And if I press space now to start, and it actually says space in the title, and then it tells you QAPL, and then that gives you the directions. QAPL on the keyboards will move you around. And now we... <laughs> We've got our little squiggle jumping up and down, and you can see the squiggle again up in the top left-hand corner. And if we go complete this, there we go, little smiley face. We'll start again. So on the squiggle, if I don't die, when they jump, the little mouth, this is very, very subtle, the little mouth gets smaller. And then if I go back over something I've already been on here, then it just stays square. But if I go into a new tile changing the color, then I'm happy. Oh, it's so simple. And then we've got these baddies up here. Um, and the more levels you get through, the more baddies you have. Let's have a look at first at the font, and then we'll go have a look at these little sprite things, because I think they're kind of interesting. Right, so this is the Q font here. If I go and, hmm, if I turn the word wrap on, view word wrap, you'll see that this here is, this font is probably bigger than the whole of Sculpture, one of Peter's projects, just to encode the font. I'm going to see if I can find that file so I can put it up onto the video in a little bit. But also the other thing that I want to show is right at the top. So up here we have this thing called Resize Canvas. When the project starts, it measures the window size and then it fits a canvas to go inside. But if we're down in Qbert mode here, we'll actually create a thing called a squig buffer. And then in the squig buffer, we'll then start to draw some um, black outlines and then drop the pixels in and then put the colors in after that. There is, I'm not going to go through it now, but there's a little bit of logic in here for how it draws the squiggles. And I'll put some up on the left hand side. These are the ones that came out. But I didn't just want to make a single squiggle, I wanted them to be generative, of course. So in the 80s pop generative project, you not only have one game but two games, but in the second game you have a mini generative art project to create the squiggles and another one to create the enemies which are based on sea hams, obviously. So everybody's squiggle is actually unique and I'll put a range of them, there should be a range of them on the left. And down here we have the make enemy buffer where we're going to go through and you know, the enemy's lengths of them, and we're going to start drawing all of these. So I draw, I think I draw, there's the eyebrows, fill eyes, the right eye, the left eye here. So it's actually drawing them the ears. <laughs> and it's defined what they all are, the different colors. So those are again, they're deterministic, but they're different for each person. So each person gets their own set. Again, I need to kill the player because there's only 10 enemies. And if they actually got to a level where it's trying to load an 11th enemy, it'll be trying to read outside of the array to load in that image that's not there. But I figure that when you're here and you have 10 enemies already on this screen, there's no way that you're going to survive anyway. And this is quite a nice example here of, of using the font. So again, I can write different things on the screen. We'll find that in a second. 
and I've got the whole alphabet. And I'm using a little bit of a sine wave just to wiggle it there. So that's Qbert. I don't think there's a huge amount of code to show on there. It's actually all kind of messy. There's a lot of thing controlling uh, if the player is dead and the monsters. If I go look at that, I have monsters and monsters count. And I have the code to reset the monsters. So let max monsters equals how many they're supposed to be. The number of them depends on the number of tiles. If I kill the player here, then the monsters are stopped. The player is now dropping out. I'm playing sounds if there's sounds available. I set a timeout to allow the player to drop back in if they still have more than zero lives. If they don't, then it's game over. And then I set the high score, which is putting the score into local storage. Um, yeah, it's a local storage down here, so you can keep track of your own high scores if you wanted to. And then we change the title back to say space to let the player know that they can press space. We have a delay in. And then this is where we're drawing it all. So if the fade counter, this bit is the bit that's fading the outer ones in and out over time. So the fade is a function of a sine wave again. Let's move on to Memphis. So we'll talk about Memphis, but I think this is probably a good point to, to talk about this. I hope it's okay that I'm not going too deep into the code, but also that I'm not, not going into the code at all. I thought this is worth talking about a little bit. So this is the structure of an Artblocks project for me. So normally with a computer program, it's a thing that is running constantly, which does happen in here at the end, but ultimately this is a script where you start at the beginning and then you end up at the end. We may have spit out a single image or we may have this system that's now going in a loop, like the games, but this is ultimately where we get to. At the bottom of the script, you have to have a whole bunch, you don't have to, but we generally have a whole bunch of features. So the code has to know what those features are at the end here. I'll give you an example of what it wouldn't be. So say you decided to draw an L system tree and over time the trunk goes and it randomly decides, so deterministically, whether it's gonna branch into two or three and it does three and then it goes into two and that one goes into three, that one goes into two and then at the end it branches again. And this is happening over the course of, let's say 10 seconds as it draws it. And then at the end it decides whether there's gonna be fruit or not and you've grown some fruit on the tree. One, two, three, four, five fruit. Now then, if you reload the page or if you resize it and you want to redraw it, you can reset the, the random, the pseudo RNG based on the original hash and it will grow in exactly the same way again. But we don't know the number of fruit until the whole thing's finished drawing. We know there's five, which means that as the code runs and then gets to the bottom, we don't know that there's five fruit to put into the features because we haven't grown them yet. Instead, what needs to happen is the whole tree needs to be simulated at the start. So we know we write a little bit of code up here, which I call make features, that basically decides, it does all the random dice rolls at the start. So it goes, oh, we're gonna have a branch. And at this point, after it's got to this height, it's gonna split into, three and it decides and then each of those branches is going to split into oh two three and then three and then at the end you're going to have one two three four five fruit and it's worked all that out before it gets to the draw stage so then you have your draw stage so once you've made all the features everything is known when you get to the draw stage you're basically just drawing everything you know from the features. If you decide to resize the canvas, and I have a resize canvas function, when you resize it, you don't need to remake the features because you already know them, you just redraw now on the smaller canvas. So that's the structure of an art box project. You make all the features, you basically have a big draw thing, but down here, because all the features have been made, they're now available to art blocks to display the features, and then once you've got to the bottom, you're basically calling, now draw it, and then that may keep calling itself to keep redrawing, and then this gets fired whenever you need it. So you have this going on. I hope that kind of made sense. So here, I've got make features. Uh, I'm sticking my hash into the top of it, so this gets called basically once. Once at the start, and that's, that's it. It never gets called again. I'm setting up all my palettes. You can see all my different colors here. And then I've got smooth palettes and contrast 
the palettes, I'm dividing them into two different types. So when I'm doing the, the standard design, when I'm trying to mix in different colours, I'll take one from, one from the top and then one from the bottom or two from the top and two from the bottom and then I've got these special ones down here and I'll sort of randomly pick between them. I'm deciding how many tiles there are going to be and then I'm deciding what I'm going to do and then I actually pick what it is and I set my mode here which later gets used in um, the features. So if I'm in normal mode, I'm deciding whether I'm going to have an outline on it or not, if it's going to be flush, which is how big and fat they are, and then I'm doing a whole bunch of palettes. So I'm going to have a primary palette, I'm picking one at random, a secondary palette, and then I'm doing stuff there. There's a very slim chance you might want to use the special palettes, there's a 12% chance, and then sometimes I reverse it. This is how I do my colours. It's a little bit of a weird one. What I do in my palettes is if I have these four colours, I basically turn them into a big long gradient starting with this one and I'll also put it again at the end. I place these ones into the gradient so I calculate between all of them and then I go oh if I'm gonna have seven lines then I pick my seven points equally along this gradient and then that's traded, translated that palette of four colors into now seven new colours that kind of fits between them. Not all my palettes are like that, sometimes I have a lot more, sometimes I have less, but it does mean that I can mix a palette that only has three main colours in and another one that has eight main colours in, and it doesn't matter how many lines I have and the number of colours in the palette don't need to match the number of lines and it just allows me to, to work through them a little bit more like that. Anyway, that's colours. In Memphis, I've got these styles, sprinkles, zigzags, arcs, circles, rings, triangles, squares, lines, 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 shape, shape, shapes. That's a sort of pseudo random way of, of slanting things towards uh, the end rather than the beginning. So I've got less chance of picking a sprinkle than I have of picking all sorts. I've got four chances of picking those. You can see these different background designs. Some of them have these outlines on and then some of them don't have the outlines on at all. I think they all have the shadows and sometimes they're all the same. These are all dots and sometimes they're mixed up with all these different random shapes. And I've got a little function that, that draws and picks all those shapes there. You can see my Memphis palettes down here, salmon pink, muted cyan, muted purples, and then the yellow bright sand teal, and even slightly brighter pink. Those are my, again, slanting uh, ways of putting bias into the chances of what it picks. I'm gonna draw this out here. So when I'm drawing these sprinkles in the background, I'm going to I do a very lazy, unoptimized way of dropping them in. So I have my square, and I basically loop round around and I try to drop something in. So I'll drop in a sprinkle and I'll give it a circular radius, and then I'll randomly place another sprinkle and I'll give it a circle radius. And I keep going here, so I'm going to have a hundred attempts. So I'm setting my bail here because if you start doing these loops while loops and they never reach their exit condition, then you're going to hit an infinite loop. So I put a bail in here and then while bail is less than five, I can keep going. I can have a hundred attempts at placing one of those in there. So I randomly pick an X, I randomly pick a Y, too close is false. And then I loop through here comparing the position of every single new one I put in with the distance from the others. And if the distance is too close, then I say it's too close and I break. So now too close is true and I increase the attempt. So I'm gonna do it again. So I'm gonna get back up to here. I'm gonna have a second attempt. So I have a hundred attempts of plot of dropping a new shape into here. If I fail a hundred times, if attempts greater than 100, I'll increase a bail. And then once I've had to, once I failed to place a thing a hundred times, five times, I know that I've placed all of them in there that I can do. You can obviously improve this by doing some sensible kind of packing algorithm or using a quad tree. I found that it's fast enough just to compare them with all the other ones and it's fine. The other thing to notice on here is that I'm tessellating. So this right hand side matches the left hand side. This sprinkle here is this sprinkle. And how I'm doing this is I'm actually drawing them I have a canvas, I'm drawing them. I only really need to do this four times, but I draw them nine times. So if I have one that's only like 4% of the way across and 40% down, I will draw it here. I will also draw it minus a whole tile 
and I'll draw it a whole tile across there as well and up here and down here. So I'm doing it up, down, left, right. And then if I have a square that goes here, centered here, I'm also going to draw one here. I'm also going to draw one here and here and then all the way up there. So if I have a circle here, it's also going to be drawn here, here and here. And this way, by drawing them multiple times, up, down, left, right, I can guarantee that they're going to tile. There's other ways of doing this, but this is good enough for me and it's fast enough for me. The shadow's done exactly the same way. So if I have these lines here, I'm actually drawing them a number of times down to the right and I'm slowly moving them up left and I'm doing them off the side as well to make sure that my shadow doesn't just cut at this point here, down here, so you don't end up with an edge where this line goes like this and then the shadow is actually like that because we didn't bother drawing anything over here. So I, I fake that I grab the line from the other side and then draw the shadow. That's pretty much Memphis. There's some logic in there to say whether there's stripes or grids in there. I really like the Memphis look. Uh, this one may be the happiest. I'm definitely going to get shirts made of this. The, trying to get a carpet made of this is really tempting. But anyway, so that's Memphis. Alrighty, how are we doing for time? It's starting to get a little bit dark outside. Let me just check the time. Doing all right. In the film and TV mode, we have Kit, Tron, Auto Man, F11, Stranger Things, Pac-Man, Predator, Haunted, VT100, OP, and I'm in love with the German film star. And so this again, we're in the make features here. So we're randomly gonna pick what we're doing. Is it haunted? Is it kit style? Then we say that it's animated because it's got swishy backwards and forwards. Uh, it's animated if this is a VT100. Stranger Things is not animated, but Stranger Things, Pac-Man, Auto Man all use the same way of drawing things. Auto Man, I actually need to build a star field for. We'll see if we can find one of those in a second. Uh, if we're Kit or Stranger Things, we're going to force the palette to be the Kit palette. If we're Predator, then we're animated and we actually have three different palettes, Predator, Predator 2 and Predator 3, that allow some different flashing through. So if we jump down to uh, Draw TV, okay, so at Draw TV, uh, we're going to say if there's going to be flickering or not. If we're pretending to be an old terminal, then we have a random amount of flickering and we're going to draw the tiles. Some things have glows around them. So Kit, Tron, Auto Man, uh, F111, Stranger Things, Pac-Man, they all have glows around them. So when we draw the tiles, we're actually drawing them a couple of times. And all these numbers here are basically telling us um, how wide to draw the lines and how many loops we should have. So if we start looking through here and we find one, so here's the Auto Man one, and this is the star field where everything is going. Again, we're trying to tile. So when something goes off to the left, then it appears onto the right. Let's see if we can find the drawing the star field, shall we? The stars are defined in the make function at the top that then works out the location of all the stars. So every time this one started, all the stars would start in exactly the same position. Uh, this is the offset, so they all start. How far they've gone is based on the time. And I think I also have a little bit about the size here. So the, the phase, the star phase, is how quickly they're getting brighter or they're growing. So some of them grow and shrink very slowly. Some of them do it faster, so you kind of have this twinkling effect. Anyway, normally in one of these projects, I will take the start time. And then as we do things, we work out how much time has elapsed. So every time a frame gets drawn, we go, how many milliseconds has there been since the start time? So when you load the page, and then after five seconds, whatever is happening is happening here. If you reload the page after five seconds, whatever happening, exactly the same thing is happening at exactly the same time. That's how the decisions get made for the enemies in Qbert. So if the player played exactly the same way every single time, the monsters would jump in exactly the same way every single time, complete deterministic. In that case, because the player may die at different points, after the player's died, then it will start to affect which way the monsters go. So I normally use a start time. On the stars, I figured that at uh, what point they were in the glowing stage probably didn't need to be completely deterministic. The fact that they're the same number of them and they're always going to be on those same lines is good enough for me. 
Anyway, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking at the glows. Instead of there being a solid line drawn on these things, there's actually a number of them. You can see them here in Tron. This is sort of the glow for the light cycles in Tron. Uh, a same again for the terminal, only in this case we've got this little gradient going down and there's a slight bit of a flicker, you probably can't see it on this video. Tron again, I'm in love with German film style, it's a classic 80s track and the album cover has these two colours on which is why that's there. Uh, F111 is based on Zig Zig Sputnik which were in the 80s. I think trivia wise there's a reference to Zig Zig Sputnik in both 70s Pop Series 1 and 70s Pop Series 2. I'm not sure if I'll put a Zig Zig Sputnik reference in all of my projects but it's pretty close. Uh, the Pac-Man, the time that I had and the amount of code given, even though it was possible, I've only put the dots in the straight lines because that's doable. Um, I haven't done them in the curves. So what's actually happening here is these are the lines drawn with an outer glow but then the very last line is drawn in black over the top of it so you end up with this negative space around there. So that's what's happening in the Pac-Man. More glowing. Uh, this is Stranger Things, obviously it's got the red glow. And if we can just find uh, Ocean Pacific, this has a special bit of code to make the lines white and this gradient to the background and this is designed, this is based on the fashion brand from the 1980s who had t-shirts in this classic colour. Now I explained this earlier about running colours down the lines. I think I can roughly draw it again here, that if I had a curved tile that went that way and one that goes that way and we'll go, for example, and then we'll have just straight lines down here is, oh I've actually drawn a really bad example. Let's turn it around. That if I start here, this is, this is zero, zero, this is one, zero, this is two across zero, this is two, one, and this is one, two. So this point here is, uh, zero zero and it's the first one and then when you come down to here now it's zero one and it's the first one actually that should be zero zero so this is zero 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 this is zero zero one zero zero two zero zero three zero zero four we get down to here is zero one four and at the same time the start of this line here will be zero one four so we know that the end of this line and the start of this line match and we can make this all one complete line and if I flow colour down here, it'll go down here, it'll match up to here, it'll go to there, it'll come out here and then it'll join to whatever happens to be there. And then that side joins this side, so the colour will flow through here and then it'll flow all the way around to there and then it'll go to there and then it'll come out of here and then it'll match back up to here. So this way all these colours go through the whole system and it fills all these tiles which is how we're getting the colours here. And then I'll go across, I'll flow the next colour down and then I'll flow the next colour down and the next colour down and the next colour down and then I'll go all the way across so these will eventually be filled and then if I find one that hasn't been done then I'll fill it in with a different palette. So when I get down to these points I'll see if I can go find one for you. So on this one you can see I'm starting at the top and I flow that colour down and it goes up there and it goes up there and then it goes around this orange bit. As we get to here it'll go oh this line here hasn't been coloured in so I'll now colour this in from the next palette. So it does that in blues and it goes around and it fills them all in. Now that it's done the first palette here, the second palette here, if it found another circle it might fill it in with the third palette if I have three palettes or it'll go back to this one. So this is where I start getting these variations. So here's a two palette one. It's connected all of these and then these ones are connected. And of course, again, they will tile. This top right matches the top left. It goes around there, it comes back in here. So that's how we have these designs. There are two different types, three different types of normal pattern. So there's these ones here where the lines are just drawn. So this purple is drawn here, then the orange and the red. And these black gaps, they're just not drawn at all. That's looking through to the canvas behind. And the reason why you don't see these lines behind them is these, these curves are actually broken. It knows about the start and it knows about the end. It doesn't even attempt to draw this line here, which is different to 70s pop. If we go look in the code, uh, broken lines, make break points. So this bit here will take in the number of lines and so actually make break points. Here we go. This is actually the hard coded break points in angles. So if I have one line, 
just that, there's no break. If there's three lines, there's no break, there's no break, but this one, it'll break at 13 degrees. So as soon as you hit 13 degrees and 13 degrees here and here, it knows that there isn't anything there. So if there's two points, let's say here and here, it knows at 25 degrees. That's not 25 degrees, but you get the idea. So as we get down to, um, all the way down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we assume that this is the thing covering them, then the first 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are not broken, but then these ones are. And you can see that they're broken at 19 degrees, 10 degrees, 6.5 degrees, 4.2, and then 3.1 if I'd drawn that one in. So that's how it works out these lines here, and it never, I never have to cover up the lines. There's no hidden lines. But the reason for doing this is that this brings my code in line with the pen plotting that I do behind me here. So this is a pen plotting thing that I stopped halfway through. And you can see there's elements here where the outer lines have been drawn, but they, these inner lines haven't been drawn. But the, it knows not to draw these lines whatsoever because the pen plotter, obviously if I drew everything, you would see through it to the other side. So by changing, setting up this code here for NFTs and for art blocks, it's now in parity with this code here for my pen plots. So I can take the output of this and then pen plot it over here. And going forwards, it means that my code matches between art blocks, uh, 70s pop, 80s pop, 90s pop, 70s pop deluxe, all of those things. The pen plots and the prints when I start printing things out in, uh, in the colours. I don't have any examples down here, but things like the screen prints, this is all based off the same code now, so here's another screen print. Uh, ridiculous things like these pyjamas. These things I can send to the printer and I can do these both uh, as bitmaps, JPEGs, or as vector graphics, and they can all come off the same code base, which is why I went to quite a lot of effort to get this to work. Let me pop these away. Right, so we have these type here, uh, which is one of our standard types, and then there's a second type that has, uh, where it's all flush. So I've made the lines, when I'm drawing the lines, I've made the lines wide enough that they match up with the ones next to them, and there's no gap between them at all. So this, this is called Chonky, this is the Chonky format. I really like this. This is the code that, that I had running before when I made those screen prints. And to start off with, I thought that this wasn't right. It was just a way for me to debug the code and see what the outputs were. And then it started growing on me. So after doing those screen prints, I then came back to the code and started pushing it forwards for use in this project. And the final one is this, which has a subtle black outline on it, which is closer to the 70s pop design. So you draw the lines, but then each side of the line also has um, a black outline stroke on it as well. It's quite a subtle difference, but it makes them pop out. So these ones are touching, you can see them, and then these ones have these black lines around the edge of them. So there's like three different formats. So this is the bit of code here where we have the lines, and we're using a color map, and we're going through each lines, and this is the complicated bit I was talking about. We have an ends map and a starts map. That's where it's allocating the ID to the start and end points of the lines. So we go through, and then we have these ones that are split, and we join them together. So we build up our line map, and now we have a color map that's completely empty, and we get the palette pointer. So as we go through the palette, we move through onto the next color, onto the next color in that palette. We work out whether we finished or not, and while we haven't finished or there's nodes to do, we keep doing it. And then I'm going through. So this is the bit where I'm going through nodes done, color map, pick the color, add the color to the line so each line knows what color it is. And we loop through this bit here uh, is quite complicated and really broke my brain for a long time. And debugging it was really hard because it's really hard to visualize what the output is. This code was a lot longer and then I simplified it down to this. I will again be using this code somewhere else. It joins everything together. I think uh, this is the end bit of code. This is the extras. I'll talk about this a little bit here. So I'm now binding my key down, down to here. So S 
downloads the canvas, H toggles the high resolution on and off, and when we do that, we resize the canvas, we clear it all, and we redraw it again. The auto download canvas is just up here. I'm creating an element with an anchor on it. I'm setting the file name, so every time it downloads it, it has the hash as well. It'll actually use an image blob that turns it into a PNG. It'll pretend to click the link, it'll download it, and then it removes the link again. That's that. Whew. Thank you for joining me on Art Blocks Behind the Code.